All right, on this episode, we're going to go over pulmonary disease patterns on the ECG. So specifically, when we talk about pulmonary disease patterns, there's a little bit of confusion sometimes because, uh, well, A, there's lots of different pulmonary disease, and they can have different things. So I'm not referencing, in this case, uh, RVH, RV strain um, patterns. I'll talk about that in a different episode. In this one, I want to focus on basically COPD, emphysema, uh, and these end-stage patients and how that affects uh, the ECG. So real quick review on pathophys of COPD. So the, um, their restrictive lung disease in which air trapping is present, that air trapping um, will eventually, in uh, the later stages, you can see a flattening of the diaphragm as their uh, uh, lung volumes increase. Um, from the air trapping. Now, this is interesting because as far as ECG goes, a lot of times we focus on um, either electrical changes or ischemic changes. And the changes that you see on the ECG from pulmonary disease of COPD actually has to do with anatomical movement of the heart itself based on these changes. So there's two important positional changes that occur in these patients. The first one is that because the diaphragm flattens, the heart which typically is, is kind of cocked a little bit to the left, drifts into a more vertical pattern, and then it rotates clockwise from an inferior viewpoint. Basically, uh, the right ventricle uh, is pointed straight at the front of the chest. Okay, so it, it drifts vertical and rotates slightly. Um, the right ventricle rotates forward. Okay, and so I can, here's a, um, here's a, X-ray that kind of shows that flattening of the diaphragm. So you can see the heart is normally cocked off to the left, and in here it's drifted. Uh, the spine somewhat occludes the majority of the heart here on the on the X-ray, and so that vertical drift is going to cause changes on the ECG. Now here's an animation uh, that I drew that kind of gives you a better example. So the person on the left, uh, kind of think of that X-ray that was in the previous slide. So their normal vector is going to be going right at two. So depolarization wave is going to be lead, heading right towards lead two, which is going to look like uh, a the tallest QRS complex is going to be present in lead two, which is your normal axis. Now you can see in the COPD patient with that heart drifting vertical, that's going to shift that vector more inferior towards the feet uh, or towards AVF. And so that's going to leave you with a QRS complex that's most upright in either AVF or possibly three, um, which would cause a right axis deviation if it drifts all the way over towards lead three. Now that was vertical viewpoint. From a horizontal viewpoint, we gotta switch to the chest leads. Remember basic ECG, the limb leads look at the heart from a vertical axis, the uh, precordials look from horizontal plane. So in a normal heart, the right ventricle, while it is faced somewhat anterior, uh, is a little bit more lateral. And then as, as that heart drifts vertical, it rotates that right ventricle forward. And what that means in a standard adult patient is, is that since the left ventricle dominates the horizontal plane, uh, and basically on an ECG, if we remember normal V1 is always negative, V6 should be all positive, that's because everything is moving from right to left in an adult human. Uh, the left ventricle dominates uh, the ECG electrically. And so because of that electrical dominance, um, V6 is upright, V1 is negative. In the COPD patient, we're now rotating that horizontal vector towards the spine, towards the back. And so what's going to happen is, is that typically leads like V3 and V4, which are uh, classically called our transition leads because they're transition, the QRS transitions from negative to positive. Now that vector is going to be moving away from all those leads. And so you're going to end up with deep S waves or deep negative QRS complexes in those anterior leads, indicating a posterior flow front to back uh, from the horizontal viewpoint. That is classic respiratory disease pattern. Okay, so what to look for in the ECG. So a persistent S wave throughout the precordials, that indicates, again, think about it, your precordials go on the front, uh, they look at the front of the heart, they go on the chest and they look. If I rotate that vector towards the spine, the depolarization vector towards the back of the patient, you're going to have negative waves, which are called S waves, throughout your precordial leads. So if you see an S wave in V6, it should already be keying you in that you have some sort of abnormality. Uh, V6, remember, should be almost completely positive uh, in a normal patient. So if you have that combo, a persistent S wave in the precordials with an axis of 90 degrees or higher, uh, again, that's just a fancy way of saying that AVF or three has the most upright QRS complex in your limb leads, then you uh, have criteria for a pulmonary disease pattern.
Okay. Now, what can muck this up a little bit is that COPD um, is often accompanied by pulmonary hypertension, and this can, and especially during exacerbations, this can lead to RV strain and RVH patterns. So, not only are you going to see all those things that I described, but interspersed with that, you may see things like incomplete or complete right bundle branch blocks. Now, remember, uh, I talk about in another video. Uh, about the right bundle and it being a thin filament. It is easily compressed, and if that right ventricle strains and dilates, especially if you have any dilation of the RV, it can mechanically compress the right bundle and cause an incomplete or complete right bundle. Anytime you see a right bundle branch block, you should be thinking about pulmonary disease in your patient or work of breathing, uh, especially if you have an otherwise healthy patient with a new onset right bundle. A lot of people are taught to just not worry about it because right bundle is no big deal. If you see one manifest in front of you, it's an, it's an indication of acute RV strain, and it may actually key you in that a patient's having a significant PE or some sort of RV failure. Okay, so here's an EKG for you. So again, we look, and what's the abnormality here? So if you look at the precordials, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, all six of them have negative waves. In fact, um, V6 is still, it's close to isoelectric, but you have a significant S wave. V6 is supposed to be positive. V4 is supposed to be positive. V3 is supposed to be biphasic. And instead, you see these negative waves that persist through the precordium. They're narrow, indicating that this is a sinus rhythm. And so we are using the conductive network. Um, this is indicating that posterior deflection from the horizontal plane. Okay, now we come over to our hexaxial leads and we see those giant tented P waves. That's another thing that can key you in. This is called core pulmonale. You have those, that's right atrial enlargement. Uh, again, people with COPD typically have high pulmonary pressures, and so that's going to enlarge the right ventricle. And as the right ventricle stiffens and gets harder to fill up, well, the right atrium uh, is going to have to work harder and it will also fill up. And so this is a classic respiratory pattern. When you look at this, it should scream to you that the patient has some sort of respiratory disease or respiratory problem, or at least some issue with the RV. Okay, here's another one. This is a little bit more subtle. Now, again, uh, you can see your, your QRSs are very small in amplitude in V1 and V2 and V3, but you can see a persistent S wave in four, five, and six, indicating that posterior flow. Now you look over to your hexaxial leads, one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF. You can see lead three is the most upright QRS complex that indicates a right axis deviation. Okay, so this patient has pulmonary disease plus an enlarged right ventricle, which is associated, uh, commonly associated with um, that respiratory disease pattern. Now, that's also why in V1, V2, and V3, you have those almost isoelectric amplitudes. It's because the RV, RV has become enlarged. It's increasing its electrical voltage. And so you're, it's actually competing with the left ventricle for electrical dominance. And so in the leads that look closest at the right ventricle, which is V1, V2, and V3, you're actually seeing kind of a washout. And that's why it looks so low amplitude. Here's another example. This is a, a more classic presentation. So this is, uh, you see the negative deflection in V1, V2, V3. Well, V1 is negative like it's supposed to be, but V2, V3, V4, um, uh, very deep S waves, um, still persistent in V5 and V6, although in this one, V6 is still positive. Um, but you can see here, the reason I use this example, look at the, uh, look at the leads, the inferior leads. You can see those tall, tented, uh, P waves, uh, that in that is clear indication of right atrial enlargement, which often is associated with these uh, end-stage uh, pulmonary patients. Okay, another example, you can see that persistent S wave, that negative deflection is throughout the precordium. V1 is upright, which should already key you into an abnormality as well, because V1 is supposed to be negative. And this is another patient, clear pulmonary disease with RV enlargement. Now, how do I know that? Well, not only do you have that persistent S wave indicating that that rotation of the heart, but I can look over at the hexaxial leads and I see a QRS that is most positive in lead three. That's a right axis deviation. Then I look up at V1, which is kind of your right ventricle lead, and I see a positive wave when I'm not supposed to. That Those two things together indicate the RV is generating extra electricity, and that is either from acute RV strain or RV hypertrophy. And again, in this patient, pre-diagnosed with end-stage COPD, we can assume that that is their normal ECG presentation and that they just have a hypertrophic right ventricle. So 
Final thoughts on this one. Look for the negative QRS in most, if not all, the precordial leads. Again, I can't stress this enough. If you don't know what normal is, I don't know how you're going to diagnose abnormalities. V1 and V6 are your hexaxial anchor leads. You should be looking at them. V1 should be negative uh, with its QRS and its T wave. Both of those should be pointed down. V6 should be upright with its QRS and T wave. If you don't have that, you have some abnormality. We don't know what it is yet, but we know we have an abnormality. And so in this one, if you see an S wave that persists throughout the precordium, that is abnormal. Um, and pulmonary disease patterns will present that way, often with that pattern along with a uh, an axis that's closer to 90 or 120 degrees, which means that AVF or lead three would be the most positive. This is especially true when it is accompanied by RV strain or RVH, which is very common, in which case the right ventricle is going to start increasing its electrical production. It's going to compete with the left, left ventricle for dominance. And so you're going to start seeing that right axis. You're going to start seeing R waves present in V1 and V2. I hear a very concerning thing about people talking about R wave growth in V1 and V2 in regards to posterior MI. That is absolutely true. As Q waves form on the posterior wall, they will show up as an R wave, they can show up, I should say, as an R wave in V1, V2, and V3. That's great. If you have any suspicions of posterior MI, put those leads on the back and see if you have ST elevation. However, far and away, way more common, when you see R waves in V1 and V2, you should not be thinking P, uh, posterior wall MI. You should be thinking about RV strain and RV enlargement in these pulmonary patients. If I have an R wave in V1, it's way more likely that the patient may be suffering of, a, of an acute PE than they are a posterior STEMI. And the problem with that is, is that your therapies in PE completely change in comparative to that posterior wall MI. So again, not that I'm saying you don't do those posterior uh, ECGs, not that you don't look for that pattern, you absolutely should. Um, but more, more times than not, when you see R wave growth in V1, V2, it's either pulmonary disease patterns or an RV strain pattern. Uh, and I'm, I'll have a video on diagnosing PE and RV strain uh, a little bit later.